Firstly, welcome to this webinar. It's uh, uh, in a whole series of webinars and podcasts uh, that Pump Call are doing. Uh, Sean, I think, has sent you all a list. Um, there's various recent ones. I think Annie, Annie Ward did one on costs. I think Imogen did one fairly recently on arbitration. Uh, if you've missed any of those or you'd like to um, check out the notes on those, then they're all on the website. Now, I'm going to be talking today um, on a financial remedies update. Um, and many of you who have, uh, have attended seminars back in the good old days when we could all see each other face to face uh, in a room will know that what I try to do is uh, I try to put um, some cases together that are checklists. They give some easy guidance. You don't have to read pages and pages of, pay of, uh, of cases. And they give you some guidance on the sort of tricky issues that crop up in financial remedies. So what I've done today is I think I've put through about half a dozen, maybe a little bit more uh, of cases. Uh, I've set them all out on various notes. And if you want a copy of my notes and slides, then let Sean know and we can pass those on. Um, what I can say is that um, towards the end of the, the seminar, I only listed for an hour, I think, uh, towards the end of this seminar, I was going to set aside some time for questions. Uh, I've got a couple already been sent to me, but if you want to uh, put your questions down on any on the chat facility, then I'll try and do what is very tough for me and multitask. I'll try and deliver the seminar and read your questions as we go. Now, um, let's start with the seminar uh, slides. The cases um, I'm going to deal with today, there's, there's a number. We're going to deal with th third party resources. We're going to deal with um, conduct, uh, valuation of private companies, um, a little bit on arbitration uh, and a little bit on capital. Then there's another few cases. There's one on pensions. I bet you can't guess what that one is. Uh, I'm only going to touch very briefly on that. Uh, and then also a little bit about interim provision. So uh, what I'm also going to say is there's going to be one case in here which will have you dreaming of about five hours time, an early evening in the sun. And I'll see if you can spot which case that is. Let's move on. First case I'm going to be talking about is M&M. &M. Uh, it's a lovely case. I play that about not many cases, but this is a very lovely case because there's about five topics it deals with. It deals with conduct. It deals with business valuations. It deals with remote hearings, something we're well used to now. It deals with third party resources, and then it touches a little bit on the housing need of the parties. It's also um, was presided over by Robert Peel QC. He was sitting, I think, as a deputy high court judge. As you may be aware, he was appointed a high court judge in October last year. I've got a, a very soft spot for Robert Peel QC because I did a very um, difficult, I would say, FDR in the Bournemouth, uh, Bournemouth in the Birmingham Family uh, Remedies Court. He was presiding. It was all to do with overseas trusts and goodness knows what. And uh, he, he found in our favour. I think we we're about 100,000 out on about a two million pound uh, offer that we'd made. So uh, I, I like it very much. What, what, I, what I did find, he was, he was very, very good, as they would be. Uh, he obviously read all the papers. He was very helpful to the parties. And I don't think either party, even the husband in that case, probably went away and didn't think he'd had a fair trial. He didn't like the indication that he'd been given. So certainly um, good news that he's been appointed. And I think we'll see some new uh, cases, interesting cases from him. Um, what's this case about? Well, I'm not one for reading out the slides. You can see that's the sort of background to it. What I would say, though, is when you read that second bullet point, a financial remedy proceeding described as ruinous and recriminatory, that is a, is a byword for ka isn't it? It's a byword for this is going to bring up the costs uh, and the parties hate each other and this is going to go on and on and on. What you'll also see from that slide is that um, what the legal costs were. Again, ka -ching. So you tend to think this is multi-million pound case, isn't it, um, uh, to get to that sort of level. Some of you uh, who are in this, um, in this uh, listening to this seminar might be used to cost of that level. I'm surprised uh, if you are living to the, listening to this seminar, you do produce cost at that level because I imagine you've got far better things to do uh, sitting on the yacht or, or drinking a glass of champagne. But certainly £594,000 of the costs, astronomical, and as a result of the ruinous and recriminatory uh, proceedings. Why did it get to that level? Well, um, you can see lots of hearings, uh, FDRs, and then lo and behold, there was an aborted five-day five day trial. So you tend to think with that level of costs, well, what are the assets? You can see there, 
uh, there wasn't a lot of liquid capital. It was the house proceeds. It was a bit of pension. But the complicating factor in this case was that wife was a shareholder in a, a family business, a family business of hers. Uh, you see, it was gifted to her two years before the marriage, so a pre-matrimonial asset. Her parents had uh, the majority shareholding and her brother held um, a uh, similar share to the, to, to, to the wife, his sister. Now, um, what the um, husband said is, well, these companies that the wife has brought into the marriage are worth some 10 million. And um, therefore, I want to share it. Now, what he said, and this is a very interesting sort of lesson for us all, really, he, he made an application at the first uh, appointment for a single joint expert. Well, why did he do that? Because bizarrely, the rules say, not bizarrely, but people sometimes forget it, the rules say that if you're going to be making an application, then it should be done no later than the first appointment. Now, um, if it's going to be an application, it's either by agreement, or if not, it's a part 18, supporting a part 25 application with all of the various details about the experts, the costs, the timescales, etc. So he did the right thing, but it was refused. Now, when you look at the reasons why it was refused, you tend to think, hmm, well, that would have been a good day uh, to have it refused, in my view. It was refused because it was non-matrimonial, non non-marital, and the share was illiquid. So he um, thought, my husband, look, I want an expert. I'm going to appeal that. And bizarrely, again, I think it was rejected again by a high court judge. Uh, he didn't stop there, the husband. He's a tenacious chappy. And he decided that I'm going to make another application uh, at the FDR. Again, that was unsuccessful. Then what happens, it's coming up to trial. And um, those are further directions, almost like a pre-trial uh, review. And eventually, a value was appointed. Now, what Robert Peel said, because he was the chap who eventually took it on, was that. Now, if you have any resistance from judges at first appointment, because other side are running that it's non matrimonial it's a liquid, it's not really an asset that needs to be brought into account, then I think you really want to be quoting uh, that case. Uh, I mean, most judges, in, in my experience, are going to say, yeah, you've got a business, it is worth something, you can make the arguments as to whether it should be brought into the pot at a later occasion. But you have to remember that Charman and Charman says at first stage is computation. And at the computation stage, you need to know all the assets, all that are available, trusts or otherwise, and it's only at the distribution stage, stage two of Charman, that you decide whether it should be brought into account and if to, to what extent. Now, um, in respect of the um, second aspect of this case, second aspect is that conduct. Now, at the pretrial review, wife had filed a section 25, uh, she'd gone the whole hog and started making all these allegations of conduct. But at the pretrial review, um, the court tried to, as it often, uh, often does, to try to limit what is going to be argued at the final hearing. You can't argue everything. Pick your best ones, and then you can argue those points on conduct. And so what the order at the pretrial pre review uh, recorded was that she was only going to be relying on conduct. She suggested that he's misappropriated some of the children's money. The section 25 statements were sequential. He was directed to respond. And what he did in his section 25 statement, he did respond. Um, and he went, um, he dealt with the issue regarding the children's misappropriation or the misappropriation of the children's funds. But he still suggested that the company assets were of substantial value and should be brought into account. Now, when we get to trial, what the husband said this is the first trial. He said, well, um, they're wholly matrimonial because although they came in early, in essence, uh, they became matrimonial and therefore I want a share of them. She said, um, absolutely not. Uh, it's not matrimonial and you can't have any share. Needless to say, we understand why. But if the court were to determine that uh, he were to be entitled to a share of that, then she is going to say, but when you were managing director of the companies, I bet the father-in-law wasn't had, wasn't uh, look back in hindsight and think that was probably the worst move I ever did was make my son-in-law a managing director of one of the companies. But I'm going to rely, the wife says, on his misconduct while he was managing director. Now she didn't plead it, and that's the key. She didn't plead it as conduct. And if you remember that what um, it had been suggested at the pre-trial review is that she was going to be limited to arguing conduct solely in relation to the misappropriation of the children's money.
Now, um, there's a classic line here, which I've used, and I'm sure many of my colleagues used is, well, um, Judge, it, 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 we're not losing it as an attacking, attacking limb. We're merely saying that we're using it as a shield. He's arguing against us, saying that well, he wants a share of it. And we want to say, well, hang about, you can't have a share because look what you did to the company. Now, you know, whatever way you dress it up, it's like that old Street and Mountford case, isn't it? If you construct a five-pronged digging implement, you can call it a spade, but everybody knows what it is. It's pretty damn obvious. She was asking the court to consider his conduct to be misconduct, which should somehow reduce any award that the court may be minded to make if they would consider it to be matrimonial property. So we use it. Uh, we often say it's a shield, not a sword. What I think sometimes can be put in, albeit it may be stretching the boundaries, is it may be a shield, but it may be a make weight. In a Section 25 statement, it may just give a cloud, give a, give a sway to the judge, thinking, well, that is one of the factors. It's not a crucial factor, but it is one of the factors I can weigh in the balance. Now, that's not what should be done, because if you're going to be pleading conduct, then you need to be pleading it, and you need to be setting it out in great detail. Now, on the last day of the trial, after hearing evidence about the uh, valuation of the company, the judge said, um, well, I need a bit more information, really. And one has to remember, I think it's Kimber and Kimber, where, where the judge says, and there's, a, there's another case, a Greek case, um, which says that the judge is not bound by the evidence put forward by the parties because the court has to inquire as to whether an order is fair. And if it hasn't got the evidence before it, the court can put the matter off, ask for further evidence, call for further evidence, for, call for further information. And that's what the judge did on this day. And the husband said, um, well, I want permission to appeal that. And on the basis you've allowed that, then I want you to recuse yourself. That was understandably refused. Uh, Moore, um, Mr. Justice Moore allowed the appeal. And to answer the point I raised earlier, can you slip it in through the back door? <laughs> no, there's no place for conduct to feature as one of the general circumstances. And the strict rules and proper rules are that if you're gonna be suggesting it and it should be taken into account, then you need to plead it. Right, where are we on the costs? We're probably up to about 400, 450, I would have thought by now. And so it gets put off for a further FDR before Mr. Justice Cohen. Remember, there's all these conduct issues going on in the background. Now, it was agreed at the FDR, so we had the determination by Moore J granting the permission to appeal um, and making those comments regarding conduct. And a bit of bullying probably went on at the FDR by the judge. And it was agreed that um, he won't suggest that the um, business interests were matrimonial. I think he was on a hard or sticky wicket um, on that point. But, and rightly so, there's still resources. There's still resources, uh, J and J, um, isn't it, Mr. Justice Charles, where non-matrimonial resources can be invaded cautiously, uh, provide if needs require recourse to such. So, right, right objective. He was never going to get home on a sharing um, sharing claim. Uh, but certainly there are resources available and if he can pursue a needs-based claim then there may be an invasion or he may get a greater share of the matrimonial asset. Importantly um, she agreed uh, reluctantly how many hundred thousand spent uh, that she wasn't going to rely on his conduct. So then it came before um, Robert Peel for this five-day hearing and it gets on to the third point I want to um, mention which is Robert Peel conducted the hearing remotely uh, by Zoom. I don't know how many of you have um, have attended or, or otherwise, we've all attended the preliminary hearings, the FDAs, the FDRs, but um, it's whether you've ever attended a remote final hearing. And certainly I've done two or three now, and it is effective. You know, it, the, the, the days of leaning forward and looking at a witness in the eye and trying to put pressure on them, many judges have never liked that, but it's very effective. As long as you can be satisfied clearly that the parties are taking it seriously, then they can be very effective hearing. And a lesson for us all really is um, what Robert Peel says, it was a very effective five day contentious hearing, including single joint expert and the party's evidence. And he made, came to the conclusion that it was not in any way compromised. Um, just pausing there a little bit on experts. I mentioned earlier on in the seminar that if you're going to apply for an expert, you need to do it by the first appointment. There is a provision in the practice direction PD25, which says that you can take an exception to that. You can apply later, for example, if there's or not, for example, if there is good cause. And what I will often do is if I've asked inquiries or made inquiries, questionnaire has been raised, 
of perhaps business interest. We want to see some accounts. We want to decide whether we want an expert or not. I will record or hope ask the judge to record in the first directions uh, appointment order that we're not surrendering our claim for a instructional expert, but we want to see what the replies to the questionnaires bring. But if we are going to make an application, we've got to good, do it in good time, well ahead of the FDR, give the other side a notice. The other side will come back and say, well, we want a provision in saying that we're not accepting that an expert is necessary. So hold, in essence, an even ground, but make sure you put in any first directions appointment that what you're going to be saying is, or you're going to be resisting, is any suggestion that you didn't make the application at the first appointment and therefore it shouldn't be included. Um, now, that's three aspects of this case. That's why I like it so much. I've read one case and I've got three bit good bits out of it. This is the fourth bit out of it, and that's the business valuations. Um, that was the outcome of the case, and he didn't apply any minority discount to her shares as it's a quasi-partnership. What I see, uh, unfortunately, still regularly is in expert reports, business valuation reports, the expert will say, and this is obviously a quasi-partnership and therefore there should be a discount of 20, 30, 40, 50%. It is not, it is not the expert's role to determine as to whether it's a quasi-partnership. It's the expert's role to give evidence, or give evidence and to advise as to what the effect would be if there were a minority discount and there were not a minority discount. And it's then for the court to determine as to whether it applies or not. Um, and that's been rehearsed in a, in a number of cases. We're going to come on to another one in a minute, a case that's going to remind you of a balmy summer evening, but I'm holding, in, holding you there in, um, in anticipation. But certainly remember that if you're challenged or the other side are coming to you and saying, look, the expert said it's a quasi-partnership and therefore the minority discount applies, depending on which side you're applying for, say, no, it's the court's decision on that. And then obviously consider the factors. Look at the articles of association. The articles of association don't apply for any minority discount. You may be on better grounds. One also has to remember with business valuations, the old, um, in plenty of cases, but you remember Mr. Justice Charles, A and A, where he said, when we're looking at business valuations, we not only look at it with a matrimonial practitioner's head on, but we look at it as a commercial, with a commercial head on. So what is the point of getting the valuation of a business if the business is never going to be sold? Um, what's the point of going down that route? We certainly need a valuation of what the shares are worth, and we need indications as to what the liquidity is, but apply the instruction of the expert as to what the reality of the situation is going to be. Right. So what was the outcome in this case? Go back to page one, I think, when I am a note. He's earning 32K and she's earning 36.5K and they've spent £594,000 to get to this stage. Get to another point. This is what I'm up to four. I think it was it five on this one now. Now we're going to deal with the resources of a wider family. And again, nutshell guide, this is what Mr. Uh, Robert Peel QC um, summarised as to how we deal with the resources of a wider family. Oh, sorry, I took you up too quick. Just pausing on that um, subsection one, where one party has an interest in an asset. Um, you remember under... Um, 24 6, uh, 6, yeah, 24 6 A, um, the much money causes that. So, where one party has a beneficial interest and a third party has a beneficial interest in that asset, then the third party has a right to be heard, for example, on any property adjustment order or, or sale. So, they have to be served, but they don't have to automatically become parties. And there's a whole host of authorities which said when, what say when parties should be joined and when they shouldn't be joined. So, remember, Firstly, it's not automatic that if someone shares an interest in a property, they should be joined. They must be served. They must be given notice to be heard by the court, but it's not automatic they should be joined. And what um, the second point says is, as in common in many cases, I've got a number coming on at the moment where one party is desperate, as they all are, to stay in the matrimonial home and the family are going to come up and maybe assist act as guarantors or otherwise. Um, and there's a distinction between the two, because if you've got an interest in a property, then you've got an interest into, into that asset, to, to, the, to the capital of that asset, or the resources of that asset. But where other family members are gratuitous donors, you don't have an automatic interest. 
and the court can consider it, but it's not an asset belonging to the parties. I'm going to take you to a lovely line. I'll just let you read those. And the sort of second paragraph, bearing in mind the court's function to distribute the party's resources and not the resources of the wider family. That has appeared in many a note I have seen and I have, I have craft, well, that's crafted, that's probably a bit too strong a word, uh, uh, that I have drafted, that's probably a better word. Um, so when you're being challenged, you're saying, well, you know, mum and dad, bank of mum and dad are going to come in and um, they're going to come and assist. You just remind the judge, that's not the party's resources. It may be the generosity, but be a little bit careful when you go down that route. Now, I said to you, didn't I, earlier about the checklist. What are the checklists that are going to be required um, for you to satisfy this test as to whether these third party resources are going to be relevant? And again, Mr. Robert Peel, is he the new Mostyn J? Uh, who knows? Um, it will be a sort of different, uh, different approach, I'm sure. But he set out these sort of checklists. Uh, and what I always say is, if you want as busy practitioners to sort of fulfill the criteria, almost have these checklists, not on your wall, I sometimes talk about fridge magnets, pump court fridge magnets with all these little guidelines on, but if you have them there and you draft a statement and you try and or you put it in the for me, this is what I've got to satisfy, it's always worth going back to the cases and finding what are the factors, because it makes it much easier, people like me and my colleagues, or you, when you argue the case to say, ah oh, well, this applies, this applies, this applies, and this applies. So have a look at that little checklist. Bullet point three there offers of interim support for legal fees. I mean, we've all used it. We said, well, they're prepared to pay the interim fee, so why won't they support thereafter? But the last is really the, the check, the check on this. If you can't establish a track record, and you're not going to have any further evidence or other evidence saying that there are going to be monies made, then it may be hard to satisfy a court that these third party resources are available. Last uh, on this case is I mentioned about housing. We all know the dicta in M and B. You've got to try and stretch the resources if you can to, to uh, allow both parties to be rehoused. Um, and then what Mr. Robert Peel said in that case is that I've had it back bound, back, back, back to, or used against me on a number of occasions where I strive for getting one of the parties a house when it's quite obvious there's not enough resources available and really we, we will really have to stretch and judges will come back and say look it's a guideline but it's not a right so just obviously be aware of that case and also be aware of that case when you're on the other side and um, they're all saying M and B everyone needs a house and uh, you say, ah, well, not everyone needs a house and there's clear high court authority on that. Um, that was the eventual element. Look, 594,000 spent on costs and look what they decided they needed by way of housing. All of those money spent on costs could have bought them both a house. And then you see the bullet point three, that's all they were left with after payment of the debt. Another little guide because Peel found because of the resources, um, 125 could be released from the husband's pension. So that could go towards assisting him with providing uh, or purchasing future accommodation. And do remember, it's 2015, isn't it, when the pensions freedoms came into place, um, that you can argue if in a small money case, you can say, look, the capital available under a, under a pension, the 25% tax free and the rest of it subject to tax can be used as a resource. You want an authority for it, you, you can quote M&M. &M. Um, now, this is the second case. Uh, and this is the case I'm going to be dealing with on conduct. Similar age parties as the last one. It's, uh, it's the Justice Mosting case, so we can expect some checklists and guidelines. Um, assets a bit more in this case. Wife is saying that there's non-disclosure, and therefore, as a result of that, because of the atrocious behaviour and the lack of disclosure by the husband, I want a bigger share. Good old um, Mr Justice Mosting. He sets out that lovely checklist. Think of all the cases he's done, SS and NS on income, future income, and in this one he's dealing with conduct. He set it down into four categories. And in respect of those four categories, we can break those down. We know what those cases are. Um, I can think of two uh, that I've done, 
two or three probably one was a place i always any of you instruct me know very very sad case where the chap was a poor train cleaner uh, he came home had a complete mental breakdown and stabbed his wife and child fortunately they survived but then he was admitted to a secure mental hospital uh, and obviously the wife uh, was claiming that he's got no need of accommodation he's going to be there for the rest of his life and therefore you know i want all of the assets that was one case another case i can think of where the wife said i'm afraid the marriage is over husband didn't take it too well uh, hit her over the head with a full bottle of red wine as many of you know I always struggle with a full bottle of red wine I don't think any bottle should be used but a full one as well um, and she unfortunately suffered some injuries and couldn't go back to the job that she was doing before on a, quite a highly paid income now I think that falls over into sort of financial financial um, res the result of the, the conduct the, the financial um, effect of the conduct she couldn't go back therefore you could quantify it almost like a PI claim but Mostyn gives guides as to when gross and obvious will be brought into account. He says in point three, as I just indicated, it should only really come into play if there is a financial consequence. Now, what I'm highlighted and I've used in a case fairly recently is he does probably live to the issue of coercive and controlling behaviour, which seems to be the big buzz um, in children law. I don't do it, but I've read a little bit about it, um, is economic misconduct can also form part or fall within the criteria of gross and obvious personal misconduct so if you're going to be pleading that someone's been not allowing you access to the monies or um, has been very not allowing you you know bullying you and being coercive and controlling not allowing you to go and get a job all of those kinds of things then plead it for goodness sake plead it in your for me or at least mention it in for me not in the back door as i said in m m you should really plead it but at least set down a marker that that's what you're going to be relying on as to whether it's going to make any difference there's not many gross and obvious cases that do make a difference, as we all know. I'm sure we've all talked to clients about, oh, well, that can be run, that can be run. But the reality is they're very rarely successful. Add back. Classic cases started, I think, Dennis and Dennis uh, moved on in Vaughan and Vaughan. Case, I think, um, looked after by Annie Ward a good few years ago. Uh, what she will say, um, if you, you don't know where she's on, but she will say is that at that case, uh, the husband had spent a lot of money, but the court could not stand the husband. And as a result, ADBAT was permitted. Now, one thinks of the other one, which is the um, MAP, is it MAP and MFP? You know, the chap who's a cocaine and prostitute addict, uh, addict to both. And in essence, the ADBAT wasn't allowed. So it is still very personal how the court approaches and views the potentially guilty party. So Vaughan and Vaughan is your case for ADBAT. And the other one, the M MP and um, MAP, and MFP, I think it was, uh, is the case which um, which where ADBAT wasn't allowed. Now, if this was a, um, a function where I could see you all, I'd ask you all at this stage is stick up your hands if you've tried to plead ADBAT. And then I'd ask you to keep those hands up if you've been successful. And I dare say, hello, I've got <laughs> I've got somebody right. Oh, I've got a few now. <laughs> okay, 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 point made, point made. A lot of you raised conduct. And the next question of the people that raised their hands, how successful have they been? Now, what you're all going to say to me, because you're bullying me now, is you're all going to say um, they're all successful. But in my experience, on both sides, it's not just me, uh, they aren't often very successful cases. We argue them, we think it's the next best thing since sliced bread, but often they're not that, um, not that successful. So just be aware of it and don't probably give it the weight that some clients would wish. Litigation misconduct. That's the third category that Mostyn uses. And he says that if there is litigation misconduct, then it's not really to affect the award. And he says it's difficult to conceive the circumstances where it should affect it, but they should be penalised in costs. And I'm going to come on later on, if I've got some time, uh, just to deal with examples of cases where litigation misconduct has been, um, has been penalised in costs. And then lastly, he says, well, there are, there is conduct where you can draw inferences. There's been a non-disclosure. The problem that I have with that is that um, whilst it's talked about conduct and it's a factor which should affect the overall award, strictly speaking, it's not affecting the overall award. What you're asking the court to do is to say there are more monies around. So the assets remain higher than as disclosed, but they are still assets. And then you divide the notional assets. So that's why I think I have sort of academically a, a difficulty with that approach, because in, for example, the 
um, personal misconduct cases, what you're asking for is give us the award and then give us a bit more. In the add back cases, you're certainly arguing you should add it back in, but in drawing inferences, you're asking the court to find there is a bigger pot. And remember, we often say they're not disclosing, therefore there should, there's, it's obvious there's lots more money around. You can't do that anymore because as Mostyn set out, I think it's, it's NG and SG as the case is, you've got to have some evidential basis on which to draw those inferences. So you can't really say there's three Ferraris outside and therefore the value of three Ferraris is, I, I don't have one, so I imagine, I don't know, 500,000 for three Ferraris, therefore you can expect uh, another 500,000 to be in the pot. They might be leased up to the hilt. So you've got to have some evidence to show what the, uh, what the uh, non-disclosed assets are broadly worth before you can even get a, car, a, a court at start to um, draw those inferences. Um, he also went on, because it's his big thing at the moment, it's not supported unilaterally, but it doesn't apply to many cases, is that if you've got cases where the parties are above the statutory minimum of child support, that's over the, what is it, 3,000 a week, then you apply the same formula, the same percentages, and that should apply up to incomes of 650,000. So that's Mostyn's check guide as to what you should apply, um, but commentators have not universally followed. I haven't found any other cases where it's either been followed by another judge uh, or has been repeated other than by <laughs> Mr. Justice Mostyn. Now, what did I say to you? I said, um, I'm going to um, give you something to remind you, or not remind you, to uh, give you hope for the end of this seminar in about four or five, four or five hours time. Um, sorry, I'm going up, I've gone the wrong way. There we go. Look at the title of the case. If you read it aloud to yourself, that's why when I see this case, think of four, five o'clock this afternoon. Some of you may have started already, but um, some of you may be later. But G&T is the case, a case I don't think you'll probably forget. I've talked about m and it's not the singer, uh, all the little chocolate things. Now I'm talking about G&T. G&T deals with the valuation of private companies. Nick Cusworth, who's doing a lot of cases uh, at the moment, um, sitting as a Deputy High Court judge, that's the background. And what the husband had was, in essence, um, a, a business which was a trading business, market trading business, not market trading as into selling fruit and veg, but um, shares and making markets. And what he says is um, there's no income stream, there's no value to this business, because in essence, I get these traders in, we make the markets, we encourage people into the markets, we buy and sell, but tomorrow may be another day. So there's nothing really that we produce. It's just really, as many of the financial sector don't, it's not something we can put a value on. What it is really, is it's just a big cash pot that I've got. He pays uh, significant bonuses to the traders, probably self-employed, although the new um, in unrevenue regulations have probably put, put, put stop to that. Uh, and so there was no real capital assets of the business. And because it's a risky market, his gross income had ranged for that over the last years. And when the single joint expert came in to value the business, they used the net asset value. Just pause in there, you're aware there's net asset, there's maintainable earnings, there's dividend yield. If I've got time, I'll touch a little bit on that. But in this particular case, the judge, uh, the uh, expert said it's a net asset value. Why is it net asset value? Well, because in essence, it hasn't got any trading history, hasn't got any consistent trading history. We can't really get a maintainable profit, but we do know there is a fund there available to be used. And again, the second point I've put there, it's nothing more than the pile of cash. I think nothing more than the pile of cash that you and I may think of, maybe a few piles of 20s and 10s tucked away in the kitchen jar, but this pile of cash was obviously several million pounds, but it was no more than that. It was merely um, cash sitting in the business. Now, um, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here is that this is a classic as to when do you value the business that the husband has? Now, what he says, and there's three options for you. Again, I might ask for some hands in a minute as to what you would go for and then what the court went for. The lowest one is the one the husband was going for. He says, right, we look at a value up to separation, 2017. Um, what um, then happened is in the coming following two years, good in the market, um, and it, the, the shares increased by 10 million. So shortly after the marriage ended or shortly after the separation, but obviously increase in um, value and therefore there was more in the kitty to argue about. And then what the wife says, oh no, we, we look even later than that. We look at October 2019 and the non-business assets were worth 4.3 million. So arguably, is there enough in the non-business assets to meet the needs? 
and should we really bring in much in on the business assets? Now, um, the reason for that is it was agreed by the parties that sharing would meet needs and therefore it's just what is an entitlement. I put down there a number of cases which I'm sure you're all familiar with, or you will be if you want to go away and read this, sipping over your G&T, um, as to how violent private companies are valued. Um, where can we, what are, what are sort of the bullet points that come from it? You know the Wells and Wells argument, the Wells and Wells argument says, well, you shouldn't give one party just the risky business assets and leave the other party with all the solid capital assets, the equity, the matrimonial home, the cash or otherwise. And whilst Wells and Wells and sharing the company can be adopted in cases, Wells and Wells, Versteeg and Versteeg, fairly recently, it's rare to adopt where one party who's leaving the marriage retains an interest in the business or company that is to be retained by the other party. Um, and so there's a sort of whole host of cases there uh, which you can look at uh, and apply as necessary. I reminded you as to quasi partnerships, do remember it's not a matter for the single joint expert. Um, this goes back to Mr. Justice Childs uh, in A&A &A, um, and X and X, I think, where it was said that when you get a valuation, you know, it probably, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, sometimes they're not worth the paper they're printed on. They give these wonderful figures, but you know, is that ever going to be really the value of the company? There's no market, there's differing results, and if you put a snap valuation on any particular day or any particular year, then it may be unfair. And it's what the market dictates. That goes back to Mr Justice Charles in A&A, &A, what he said some 15 years ago. And what Cusworth identified is that um, when you value the share, shareholding, and you structure the award, they are linked. Now, whilst it could be argued that the valuation of the shareholding falls in at the computation stage, the distribution stage, which is the structure of the award, is a subsequent stage. And what Cusworth is saying is you need to link the two. So, for example, if we've got a company worth six million and it needs to be traded out or we need to get some money from that business, it may be that there should be lump sum series of lump sum orders or there should be some percentages where one party gets it at some stage in the future. So they do intermingle. And do remember when you're instructing the expert, you're not just looking at the valuation, but you're looking and asking what's the most tax efficient way of removing monies from the business and over what period. And that is really often again, I see in some expert reports, the bodies haven't really addressed that. They see the bottom line valuation figure and they say, I want six million on it, or I want two million on it, or I want three million. And they don't think about how it can be done. And they also don't think about the consequences. Think about entrepreneurs relief. Entrepreneurs relief is a limit of 10 million. You can make 10 million on any company. I had a client very fortunate the other day who'd already at age 42 made his 10 million. And now on this subsequent company, while he wants to when he wants to sell on and trade on, uh, he'll have to pay tax. Well, I never feel sorry, I'm afraid, for people who uh, pay tax because in our business, in your business, there's very little uh, that can go through without uh, having to pay tax on it. But the, the relevance is, think about the structure. Think about it, not only with the matrimonial head, but the business head as well. And uh, Cusworth confirmed that the NAV was the most appropriate to be used. Right, I talked about the hands up. Um, when do you value it? Lowest? medium or high? And the court says, well, it depends on the facts really. And it really should be linked in some ways to the matrimonial effort. So husband says, well, you did nothing once we separated. Wife says, well, I did. I worked you right the way up to the date of the hearing. And um, what uh, Cusworth found, he didn't succeed on the date of separation because it wasn't a truly new venture. And therefore, lo and behold, what did the court do? Eeny, meeny, miny, might I go in the middle? And the judge said um, that, in essence, uh, we'll do it shortly after separation. And that's something that the wife should be subject to or receive by way of a sharing claim. That's what happened in the end. You wonder sometimes why they argue about these cases uh, with that sort of money involved, uh, but she got 45% to reflect in essence, that uh, he was keeping the company and uh, obviously he had uh, some extra contribution towards it. I'm going to touch very briefly on Haley and Haley because I know Imogen um, did a long seminar on arbitration fairly recently, but the key to this is, is arbitration, does arbitration give you a guaranteed outcome that no can, nobody can appeal? Well, how do we get to it? Haley and Haley will happen to me on, I think it was on Friday, I had a hearing listed, notes have been lodged, 
on Monday, we get a call, I get a call personally from the court uh, saying, oh, uh, Mr. Hall, I'm afraid there's no judge available on Monday, therefore we can't hear the case. Uh, we've just got a listing come back in, I think it's for is it September, I think September is the earliest date. So we've got to think about arbitration, we've got to think about whether we have um, some other form of, uh, of result because you know, another three, four months on this case is not going to help. So it's going to become, or it has become more common. They decide to go to arbitration, it, arbitrator produced the award and one party said unhappy. And so what the husband said is, right, I'm going to somehow get out of this and I'll apply every different trick in the book to get out of this. I'll apply under the Arbitration Act, that's one and two. And then the, um, you wear the court, it's the matrimonial court that holds power as to whether an order should be approved or not. Um, if I don't succeed on the arbitration award routes, then I'm going to say that it's not a fair order in all the circumstances and the judge got it wrong. He just to say it was dismissed one and two fairly quickly because it had to be um, obviously wrong and it wasn't obviously wrong. But what the test really was allowed for taking this to appeal is what is the test whether an arbitration award should be reopened or not? And that was the limit that Mr. Lord Justice Moylan allowed to the parties. One party declines to consent to the order being made into an order, what's really the route and what test should be applied. And the test is the classic appeal test. Is there a real prospect of success? And what the, um, whilst the court said that it's got to be a real prospect of success in order to be able to get a court to look at why an arbitration order should not be made into an order of the court and approved by the order of the court, it's still the court that holds that authority. And the agreement is influential, as it would be with any type of agreement, the agreement made in arbitration as to the agreement made with the benefit of legal advice from both parties, but it can still be rejected as unfair because the court, Kelly and Corston, Lady Justice Butler Slot years and years ago in that case said, look, we're not a rubber stamp. We do have to look at see whether an order is fair. And what was suggested by Lady Justice King was, it's no more weight to an arbitration award than to an agreement reached between the parties. Now, that sent shivers down a lot of people's backs. And so Lady Justice King and um, thought, well, perhaps I ought to um, perhaps give some hope to all the arbitrators out there who can see their work drying up. Um, there has to be good and substantial grounds to show that it wouldn't be a fair order. And um, what we can do is we can say, look, all things being equal, is it a magnetic factor that this agreement should really dictate the outcome of the court. So we can always have a, a, a first stage, rather like under the old um, uh, section 90, what was it, 92, 14, 90 something, 14 under the Children Act, where you have to show cause in essence as to why you're allowed to make an order within that time scale. So any cases where an arbitration order is, arbitration award is made and one party is resisting, is the other party will say, right, I want you to notice to show cause as to why that order shouldn't be fair. And then a judge will triage it uh, at an early stage. But to give hope to those arbitrators who just on their way out to the door to the job center, um, it does say that all things being equal, it's more likely to be confirmed. But just be aware of that. And if you want any more detail on arbitration, uh, there is a, a very good seminar webinar it's on, on, the, on our website with Imogen Covered, Imogen Robbins, uh, a week or two back. Um, it's not the purview only of the rich. And it's going to be used. I think it will be used. I've had more cases, I think, probably in the last year. Well, not the year, because that's a little bit unfortunate, but in the last three or four months when things are beginning to get better, where cases have been pulled at the last minute. Uh, and when you try and get a listing again, you're talking months down the line. So ADR, arbitration, private FTRs, all of those are going to be a growing market. Um, what's this one? Capital claims adjourned. Uh, again, I think Cordelia is doing a, a seminar fairly soon on capital claims, so I'm going to skip through fairly quickly. I call this the snakes and ladder case, or how the rich may fall, because you can see the background to it. High standard of living, she resigned in Monaco, you've got to have 500k, not that I've ever inquired, I saw a television program on it once, 500k of euros liquid to be able to even live there. Um, sadly, that's what happened. You go from the top of the ladder and then you begin to see a snake on the next line and you begin to fall down. And so what the husband did desperately is try to reorganize the structures 
And then lo and behold, from a life of luxury, he's declared bankrupt on his own petition, owing 33 million. Now, wife says, uh, he hadn't disclosed, but in essence, I want 2 million, or we'll have to adjourn your capital claims until after your bankruptcy's ended. She had to go through a 10 day trial until it became clear that probably what the husband was saying may indeed have been right. Um, but he should have disclosed that a long time earlier and it would have stopped all the evidence having to be heard and trawling through as to whether there was deliberate non-disclosure, whether he was telling the truth or otherwise. And so the award that was made by Mrs Justice Roberts um, was we give her a PP's order, that gives her the key in the door, and we'll give her a capital claim, uh, but if it's not um, brought back within seven years, it's, then it should be, um, should be dismissed. And what she did find is, if it had been clear, you can just see that last bullet point. He was trying to trade himself out of it. And that's the sort of background to it. He'd not been very, well, 985 million that he's appropriated. He'd sold a house where um, that was originally going to the wife. And he'd also drawn down his pension and not told anybody. So um, he clearly wasn't getting the favor of the court, but the court did find that in essence, there wasn't the money around currently at this time. And what Mr. Justice, Rob, Mrs. Justice Roberts found was, you know, if you'd have come clean at the start, if you'd have given her everything, instead of just play these games where you open this company, you close this company, you trade this, you trade that, then we might have, from a very early start, seen that you don't have any money. And then we could have considered the, the, consider the case appropriately. And so as a result of that, 60% of a firm wife's costs were paid by the husband. You know, where they can be paid, where they have to be um, deferred until he gets his money, that's another matter. But certainly, going back to the Mostyn case on conduct, that's litigation misconduct, which is awarded in costs. So if you do adjourn capital claims, and again, I think I've only done a couple of uh, claims. One was where I was for the son of the Lord of the Manor, a uh, very lovely estate somewhere uh, in the south of England, where the son and his wife, two kids, lived in a grace and favour apartment on the, on the estate. Um, they then had the luxury, the husband and the wife of basically leading a life of luxury, going off and becoming artists and yoga teachers and goodness knows what, because they know they don't have to get a job because they know they're going to come into money at some stage. Needless to say, when the marriage ended, husband says, I've got no money. I uh, haven't got anything. I've got a few brushes and I've got a few paintings which I can't sell. Uh, and we managed, or I managed in that case, uh, to persuade a court that it was a hereditary period. He was going to inherit the estate. There were elements of trust. But the wife didn't have anything and she was having the children and therefore there needed to be, for fairness, an adjournment until the father died. I think we put a time limit on it in the hope that he died, no disrespect, we can always come back at some stage to extend it, uh, and because there was some guarantee that there were going to be some monies around. I've given some examples and I'm running through very quickly because Cordelia will cover it, I'm sure, of the examples where capital claims have been adjourned and there has to be some basis. And the summary is that. Um, right, coming to the end of the slides now, uh, I told you I'd just give you some updates on other recent cases, and I told you I'd tell you about a pensions case. Uh, I'm not going to go, I, look, I've put three points on that because I don't imagine any of you haven't used, been referred to, read, or otherwise, the case of w &H, uh, by his own Judge Hess. We all know his son, Judge Hess, very good practitioner, very good district judge in the CFC, very good judge in Swindon now. And I was in front of him um, and I half thought this was going to be a pensions case that he wanted reported in the CFC recently. It was on a first appointment. The other side was saying we need a pension report. I said we don't need a pension report because the, there's a lot of other assets around. The pensions were still worth a bit, but they are all defined contribution schemes. They're all money purchase schemes. And um, what the other side said is, well, the value you've given or the value you've got from your fund providers is not a transfer value. They didn't understand that, and you know, Hess was very calm with them, but they just didn't understand the difference. You get a fund value on the day because it depends what the market is, but that's not strictly a transfer value. And so Hess said, well, look, we'll ask for the transfer values from the fund providers. And then if you want to make a claim for an application for a single joint expert, then you can do. But I'm telling you now, I don't think it's going to be necessary. So he is an expert in the field, as we're aware. What were the three points and the three paragraphs out of W and H you need to concentrate on? I had a judge on Monday, I think, um, said, well, as um, his honour judge Hess said in paragraph 61 of W and H, B 
because we all know it's either going to be 60, it's either going to be 61, or it's either going to be 62. And I'm not going to go through them. What's going, what, what is the preferred course? Depends on the facts of the case. But generally speaking, we're looking for an outcome which produces a quality of income rather than the capital fund values. As to apportionment, uh, what Hess says is a needs-based case. Apportionment is no different, really, from a matrimonial, non-matrimonial asset case. You can exclude it if there's enough resources around, but you don't exclude it if recourse to such is required to meet the party's needs. So where I, where I have a fundamental bugbear on apportionment is that when it is applied, it's done on a straight line basis. So, you know, you can start off very lowly paid on a uh, employer contributory scheme, and then it's only in the latter years that you start to get better pension provision, or indeed you might have put more into your pension, and yet still the actuaries say, we merely say, this is a 10 year marriage over a 20 year accrual, and therefore only half the pension comes into play. Well, we know that it's the latter 10 years, the marital years, that have put the benefit on to the value of the pension. I'm on a losing streak on that one. I haven't seen many cases uh, that, um, that apply that, that uh, approach to reports, um, but I'll just let you know my bugbear. Um, offsetting. In that particular case, uh, Hess said no, uh, husband didn't want offsetting wife wanted offsetting uh, and therefore because the husband didn't want it and the husband needed his share of the capital I don't think offsetting is appropriate uh, you know, in very small money cases sometimes office offsetting works if parties agreeable to it offsetting works but we're still stuck that we don't know what the exchange rate is um, you'll know about the PAG report what you may not know about is another cracking um, and if you don't know about it I'm sure your clients will there is a booklet which has come out I say a booklet it's it's a bit like Tolstoy. Um, it's a very long booklet, but it gives examples to parties. This is your divorce. This is what we can help you with on pensions. Uh, and so certainly download it, not least of which, because when your clients come in and say, oh, I've read the survival guide and at page 17, it says this, it would be rather embarrassing if you didn't know what they were talking about. I'm sure knowing that you're attending these types of seminars, you're perfectly aware of all these things. But I thought just in case, or you've lost the reference, that's what you should be looking at. Um, another one quickly from Mostyn, which I find amazing. Judicial concern over high costs in the case. This is Mr. Justice Mostyn, Mr. Moneybags, Mr. Money uh, Award, as he used to be known. He started it off in J&J &J a few years ago when he was appointed High Court judge, criticising the high costs of uh, financial remedy cases, criticising the high costs because he's no longer receiving it, I imagine. Um, but he said in that particular case that because one party hadn't, in essence, engaged in the um, uh, uh, in making offers and they'd run bum points, uh, then we should be uh, a cost order would be awarded. Uh, again, if you want more detail, look at Annie's webinar on costs in financial remedy cases. Um, but para 4.4, which I'm going to touch on very briefly, is a um, is a, is a game changer. Um, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Quick one on Ratton and Cooward. We all know TL, TM and ML, which are the principles for interim provision. And we've all said and used it to resist any claim from the other side. Well, you've not set out a separate budget. You've not set out an interim budget. All you've done is repeat your 4Me budget, and therefore we're not going to entertain it. What Ratton and Cooward, Cooward says is that in an appropriate case, you don't need to have a separate budget. And in that particular case, um, oops, in that particular case, there was no real, I think the award, the, the wife was seeking something like 2,800 pounds a month. Um, and it went on for a day, the interim provision hearing. And what the judge said is, um, the district judge at uh, first instance found that she should be ordered, she should receive the 2,830. Husband appealed, criticized because she didn't go through the budget, put in um, awards which weren't monthly, uh, put in school fees and say they're not monthly, therefore they shouldn't apply. And the short point there in Ratton and Coo, it is school fees can be included. You don't need a separate budget. It depends on the circumstances of the case. And when you look at cases like BD and FD and the TM and ML, they're much bigger cases and they can warrant some further investigation. Right, I get to the boring bit now, but it's the end. You'll be pleased to know and you can go off uh, and have your G&T or um, your Sip Smith non-alcoholic. I'm looking in front of me to, um, I'm at home, I'm looking in front of me to my wife's gin collection. I do see a 0% there. It's certainly outweighed by the number of 40% ones, but certainly there are gins available with 0%. Now, what are the amendments to the FPR, which came in in April? This is an important one because we're so used to these days, emailing the judge, emailing the court. And what this rule has come in and said, look, if you're gonna have any communication, you need to be copying the other side. Now remember, 
The other side often now are litigants in person. So you've got to send it to the judge and then basically take out the email and then send a copy of it to the litigant in person. But if you don't do that, there are going to be consequences. And the consequences um, are going to be that a hearing may get pulled, it won't be read, it'll be returned unread, uh, and therefore it is important you do that. Now, the exception, and the way I've got around it, is when I lodge my note day before, 11 o'clock, I'm generally very good um, about that, as most counsel hopefully are and solicitors, is when you lodge it at 11 o'clock, you don't want to be lodging it with the other the, and sending it to the other side if they haven't prepared theirs. So what I will do is I will send it to the judge, we all know the email addresses, dj or ddj dot first name dot second name at ejudiciary.net. And I say, notes will be exchanged with opposing counsel at some stage today. And that allows the judge, if they're minded to, to say, okay, well, I'm satisfied that they're not trying to pull a fast one over the others. Another case some time ago, I forgot the name of, but it, it does talk about litigants in person. It does warn that if you're gonna be serving documents, serve it in good time for a litigant in person. So don't suddenly, the day of the hearing, send a long 20 page note to the litigant in person. Give them time, otherwise the court will pull it. And there's a case I can pull up if necessary, uh, which says that that should be the approach should be adopted. Now, we know about this because the cost estimate, it's very rare when I've seen a case go past FDR, not just because of my fees, and I've recorded in the FDR order what the costs are gonna to be to final hearing, and then suddenly find that um, when we get to final hearing and I see the next cost schedule, it's the same figure. It's generally increased. So all I would really caution is when you're preparing these cost schedules and the estimates, think about what the costs are likely to be rather than just thinking this is a bog standard one day. There won't be much work to do between now and final hearing because there always is. So just be a little bit careful on that because you don't want a client to come back and say, well, you told me it was that. You don't want a court to say you told me it was that. And now it's this. Um, open proposals got to be served, uh, as you're aware. You all uh, know that it's got to be within 21 days of the FDR. And this is the, the last point, really, I want to cover on. There's this addition to the practice direction at um, paragraph 4.4. That didn't appear before. If you've got an old copy of At a Glance, you won't see it. If you've got this year's copy, it might be last year's copy. No, it wouldn't have been. This is a real factor. And this is what everybody's jumping up and down on. If you refuse to openly refuse openly to negotiate reasonably, then the court will consider making an order for costs. That counts as litigation misconduct. So follow the rules on open offers. Consider making open offers early, at an early stage. It could be time limited. So you can make a more generous offer, open it time limited, and then remove it without notification to the other side. But do be aware that if you don't negotiate, you don't send open offers, and you're relying solely on without prejudice, which don't apply, then a cost order will be made. And I'm expecting a lot of cases coming forward uh, that are going to be on cost. Look at the LM and DM cost ruling of uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn. So that, um, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion at 1.30. Now, it's not because, uh, it's not because I am trying to avoid questions because I'm happy to answer questions. And I've just got one, for those of you who want to stay, that has been sent to me in advance. The one that's been sent to me in advance is how do you deal when you have a capital award relating to a business where there is also an income award which is ongoing? So you get your capital award, one party receives their award, the other party gets the company. The company has been valued on a maintainable earnings basis, which deals with income and what the maintainable earnings are. And yet, lo and behold, how or can we pursue a claim for income as well? Now, the old argument was going to be you can't have an income claim because it's capital award and therefore the capital has already taken that into account. I think that's baloney. Um, I think it's baloney because when you do a maintainable earnings, the maintainable earnings normally allow for someone to do the job of the party who's running the business. So it might be 60 grand, it might be 70 grand, it might be 120 grand. So it's already been taken into account that the income will continue at that set rate and then the capital award for the company is made. So I think it's baloney to argue, I've argued it many a times, um, that you can't have it because you've already dealt with it on capital. You can argue it under Waggett that in essence, the capital award that you've received, the monies you received as your share of the business, once you've got your housing need met, then the additional capital is there to support your income needs. So you can run it on that, but you can also, if you're on the other side, say, yeah, I've got Waggett, but there's not enough. And I know that going forward, not only have you got the value of the company, but you've also got an income of 60, 80, 100,000 pound a year. And therefore, if you are short, then you can go against that income claim. 
going to blow sunshine now to Ed Boydell. Probably doesn't need a lot of sunshine blowing, but I will say, because he did a case um, back in 2007 called a Smith & Smith. Uh, it's a case I've used a number of occasions since, where it was in front of lovely Judge Murphy. Many of you will know, just Judge Murphy. And he said, husband uh, keeps the company, wife gets a share of the company, and the husband to pay ongoing maintenance uh, for quite a few thousand for quite a few years. Went to Linda Davis, as she, uh, her Honour Judge Davis in Portsmouth, that's how shows how long ago it was. She uh, said Murphy got it right, it shouldn't be appealed, went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal, the reference I think is Smith & Smith 2007, said no, it was wrong to have a capital award and an income court award in that particular case because it was double counting. Now, it's crucial, it's dependent on the facts, so you, might, you can read the facts, but don't automatically think that because you've given a capital award, which has taken into account an income element uh, and therefore shouldn't go pay ongoing maintenance. The argument against that is you're still going to be receiving income from the company. The capital resource will still be there in the value of the business. And therefore, I'm entitled to at least pursue a claim against the income. Right. Um, that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. I'm just going to quickly look at the chats. Um, Oh, I've got one from, uh, <laughs> I've got one which is a comment. I won't say who it is, but it says, let me know when your wife divorces you for the gin comment. Um, unfortunately, I think she's outside or she may be working. She's a barrister, as some of you may be aware. Um, I, you know, we've been married long enough. Uh, it's not to say that long marriages don't end, uh, but um, I, I think I'm fairly confident on that one. Uh, and if you look at the other side, there's a whole selection of single malts, not one of which is is uh, is a 0% proof. So if you've got any questions, then I'm happy to hang around for a few minutes to answer them. If not, send them on to me, send them on to my colleagues in chambers, because we're all, in my, ex in my experience, uh, fairly good at answering questions, no cost uh, to solicitors. And um, I hope you've enjoyed today and I hope you've been a benefit. I say, check out the other emails, uh, check out the other webinars, podcasts, uh, and uh, look at the upcoming ones uh, that are coming on uh, fairly soon. Other than that, have a great afternoon. Four and a half hours till your G&T or your single malt or your beer or whatever. And thanks for listening.